Hello and welcome to News Click and the Leaflet. Today we are joined by two eminent personalities of India's legal fraternity. We have with us Justice Madan Lokur, the former judge of the Supreme Court of India, and Indra Jai Singh, senior advocate of the Supreme Court of India and the founder of both the Leaflet and the Lawyers Collective. And we are going to be discussing a wide range of issues regarding recent developments, the Hathras gang rape and murder case, of course, the kind of rumor mongering, the kind of uh, victim blaming that has been happening around it in the aftermath. Also issues around Bhima Korega, the Delhi riots, the kind of conspiracy, the climate of conspiracy that is being, the narrative of conspiracy that's being created in the country. So thank you both of us very much for joining us today. So my first question is regarding the Hathras incident. So we've seen more developments over the past few days. On the one hand, we have seen the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath, declare a conspiracy. We'll, of course, come to that later. But we've also there's also been a long series of events. Uh, Senior Advocate Indra Jai Singh spoke to us last week on some of these issues on the systemic aspects. So I just want to ask the both of you in light of recent events, how do you see the both the response of the state and the kind of systemic failures at various levels, at the levels of the police, at the level of the medical fraternity, at the uh, level of administration, how do you see it at right now? So may I just uh, uh, make the comment that I have made earlier that when you say there's a failure by the state, it's very important to deconstruct the word state because the failure occurs at many levels. And uh, the first level at which it occurs is the police station. The second level at which it occurs is the hospital. The third level at which it occurs is the district administration, which is responsible for ensuring a free and fair investigation. And I really cannot say how far up the ladder of the state the buck stops. Uh, but I would, I would really throw open this question that do we have any concept in this country of uh, command responsibility where ultimately it is the Ministry of Home Affairs and beyond the Ministry of Home Affairs, the cabinet system, the entire cabinet, which takes responsibility for what we consider to be a, a complete failure in the administration of justice. So, uh, Yes, uh, Prasha, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned about the uh, Hathras uh, incident, you know, the beginning is terrible and the end is also terrible, right? Now, uh, why do I say that the beginning is terrible? Uh, it's, it's an admitted position that uh, this girl was brought to the police station, right? And the police refused to register an FIR for whatever reason. Now, uh, there are instructions that have been given by the Ministry of Home Affairs, and uh, it was reiterated, I think, today or yesterday, that if there is a crime against a woman, and it's a cognizable offense, then the police must, it's mandatory, they must register an FIR, right? Now, this girl was brought to the police station. It was obvious, I think it should have been obvious to the police that uh, she had been bruised, right? And uh, so therefore, an FIR should have been registered, but it was not, okay? So that's where, right in the beginning, things went wrong, you know? So now people are saying all kinds of things that, oh, you know, she was beaten up by her family and so on and so forth, fine. Assuming it to be so, even then it has to be registered, right? In a domestic violence, for example, the husband beats the wife, you can't say, oh, because the husband has beaten the wife, therefore I'm not going to register a you know, FIR. It still has to be registered. So the uh, beginning is terrible. The end is terrible. You know, suddenly in the middle of the night, they go and, uh, you know, cremate her. I don't even know whether it's cremation or whether it's just burning the uh, body because apparently no rituals were carried out. Nothing was done. They, you know, threw petrol, whatever. And uh, so therefore the whole thing, you know, the beginning is suspicious or terrible. The end is suspicious or terrible. Okay, now what happens in between is something which obviously has to be investigated. But then if you look at it from this perspective, you know, there is a lot that the state has to answer for. There is a lot that the state has to answer for. First of all, why was not the uh, FIR registered? 
Secondly, what was the reason for uh, the cremation or the burning in the middle of the night? I believe, at least I've read in the newspapers that uh, they say that, oh, you know, there was going to be a law and order situation. So therefore we had to, uh, you know, cremate her in the middle of the night. Was there some urgency to cremate her at that time? Couldn't they have waited for a day? You know, after all, a body can be preserved for a day, can be preserved for two days. What was the hurry in, uh, you know, cremating her? They could have waited for a day, got the law and order situation under control, if there was a law and order situation, and then maybe done the cremation the next day or the day after. You know, so <laughs> the whole thing is very, very shady. Absolutely. Uh, so, but you would agree that it denied the family an opportunity for a second post? Oh, yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And in this context, we are seeing this narrative of an, it being an honor killing, which is kind of shocking considering the history of uh, honor killings in India, the caste dimensions of it. And now there's this narrative being widely spread by many networks that this was some kind of an incident. So, would you like to reflect on that? Okay. You see, th this is what I'm saying that the worst worst case scenario is that she was beaten up by her family. That is a narrative that is being given now. Even then, the FIR has to be registered. Why was it not registered? Yes. You know? It's, 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 it's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, you know, in the context of honor killings, of course, we've also handled a lot of cases of honor killing. But it's normally the other way around. It's when an upper class woman yeah. has an affair with a, a man who's lower to her in the caste hierarchy, then her family turn around and kill her uh, as they perceive it to be, uh, you know, a violation of their honor in the caste hierarchy. Here you have the reverse situation. Yes, yes. And, and so, you know, it, it defies uh, your imagination as to why um, a family mem member would kill uh, his sister. But as Justice Lokur said, it's still a matter to be investigated. Right. And in this context, I also wanted to ask about a case like this being taken notice of suo moto by the Supreme Court. We've had instances in the past, in 2014, I believe there was a case in West Bengal, which was taken, uh, which the Supreme Court took cognizance of. In this case, however, there was an appeal, I mean, a PIL had to be filed before it was taken up. So could you talk a bit maybe about the grounds on which such uh, cases are taken uh, cognizance of by the Supreme Court? You see, it, it depends on uh, a variety of factors. Now here, it seems that the Allahabad High Court had taken uh, so much of cognizance of the uh, events. That could be, I don't know, that could be one reason why the Supreme Court did not take it up. Allahabad High Court is already looking into it. Why should we you know, look into it also? That could be one reason. Um, but the way it has panned out, you know, I mean, there are rapes that are committed on a daily basis. The courts cannot take uh, so much to notice of all of them. But the way in which this particular case has panned out, uh, normally I would have thought that you know, somebody would bring it to the notice of the Supreme Court, or if nobody brings it to the notice of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court might take uh, so much of cognizance. But uh, I suppose the, the only thing that I can think of at the moment is that uh, because Allahabad High Court had taken so much of cognizance, therefore, uh, you know, it, it, the Supreme Court did not deem it appropriate to take notice. Yeah. Uh, since the matter is sub judice, I also wouldn't like to say anything more than that. Uh, but uh, as one of the people who uh, was representing the hundred letter writers, more than a hundred lawyers wrote a letter to the Supreme Court of India. What I would like to emphasize is sometimes certain kind of relief cannot await determination even by a court of law. And one of those examples is witness protection. When Critical evidence needs to be preserved. Uh, in my opinion, a court of law, and in particular, the highest court of the land, needs to step in very, very urgently, at least to preserve the evidence to make sure that an appropriate court of law deals with it in an appropriate manner. And the concern here that I would like to put on record is that 
After all, the most critical witness was the mother, who was the first person who saw. She would obviously be a very material witness. And in a situation like this, where you're living in, in a village which is dominated by the Thakurs, which is the caste to which the people alleged to have raped her belong, there is every possibility of the material witnesses being coerced into making statements that they don't really want to make or uh, into giving up the case. We've seen cases where even rape victims have been done to death. Uh, forget being coerced. You know, it happened in the uh, our rape case. It could be an accident. It could be just anything. So as a matter of preserving the rights of all the parties, I think it was right on our part to approach the Supreme Court and say, grant immediate witness protection. And the court has issued notice on the question of witness protection. So I would like to pass the question on to Justin Lokur because he has been party to the framing of several witness protection programs uh, in the context of crime against women as well. Yes, I think witness protection is certainly very, very important. But here, uh, you know, when you talk about evidence, this girl was, in a sense, the best evidence. You know, was she raped or was she not raped? Was her tongue cut or was it not cut? How do we know? You know, tomorrow somebody might just come up and say, no, no, actually her tongue was not cut. How do we know? You know, so, and uh, supposing, uh, I mean, just, just assume for the sake of argument that, uh, you know, the, the medical report says that she was not raped. Like some ADG has said that, you know, we didn't find any sperm, so there was no rape. But if a proper uh, postpartum had been conducted, videographed, as the NHRC has said in uh, some cases, that would have been the best evidence for that, in a sense, that has been destroyed. You know, but the family certainly is very good evidence or very good witnesses to what has happened. And uh, they're not being allowed to meet anybody. You know, I mean, I, I also read in the newspapers that their phones have been taken away. Why, why, why should the phones be taken away? You know, I, mean, I, 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 I find this whole thing very strange, actually. <laughs> Justice Lokur, you would agree that by denial of access to anybody, that would include denial of access to lawyers, to legal assistance, to legal yeah. aid. And, and that denial of access to justice is itself a violation of a fundamental right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And you see, look at it from the point of view of the family. You know, they've just lost their daughter who has died, right? They believe she was gang raped. They believe she was very brutally beaten up. They know, as a matter of fact, that she was uh, cremated in the middle of the night. The whole, whole episode, you know, has a huge traumatic or an emotional, uh, you know, uh, reaction on the family. And then next day or two days later, you know, you go and say, all right, you know, I'm taking your phones away. Or I'm sending the, uh, you know, district commissioner to come and talk to you. Or I'm going to send some, you know, very senior person like a director general of police to come and talk to you. Are they in that kind of frame of mind? You know, when we talk about uh, sexual offenses against women, the Supreme Court has said it, that you must make sure that the victim and the, uh, uh, the, the, the offender do not have eye contact. Why? You know, the victim probably comes to the court after a month or two months or maybe three months. One doesn't know. But in spite of that, in spite of a gap of one month, take the least one month, they say you still should not have eye contact. Here we're talking about two days and may not be with the, you know, with the accused, but with persons who are in authority. Just try and imagine what is going on in their mind, in the mind, mind of the family. You know, and then I think we should be in a position to understand what's actually happening. Just to look, we also have to imagine what is going on in the minds of the 
state functionaries to be able to do things like this? Are yeah. they not expected to read judgments of the Supreme Court? Are they not responsible for uh, upholding the rule of law? And so in the context of what you said, the, the destruction of the best evidence, I, I, would, I would urge you to let us know, are there no legal remedies such as destruction of evidence uh, by people in authority? And you have written a recent article on uh, framing accountability jurisdiction. Would this not be a classic example of, of uh, laying our hands on some accountability jurisdiction over here, uh, jurisprudence over here? Yeah, certainly, certainly. You see, uh, what what is happening, it has happened over a period of time, it's also happening now, is that the state gets away with a lot of things. You know, now you look at uh, uh, what happened in uh, Jamia, all right, it's come on national TV, so it's, it's not something that is known to few people, it's on national TV. There was a boy who was being beaten up and some girls had to come forward to stop that boy being beaten up, right? What right did the policeman have to beat up that boy with a lati? There were scenes of policemen breaking the taillights of some motorcycles. There are scenes of policemen in uh, JNU smashing the uh, CCTV cameras. I think it was JNU or maybe Jamia, I'm not very sure. Smashing the CCTV cameras. I don't know how much a CCTV camera costs, but it must be costing quite a lot. So, can the functionaries of the state, in this case the police, get away with doing things which if you and I did, we would be in trouble. You know, if I go and break a CCTV camera, I'm going to get a notice for damaging public property and pay so much. But if a policeman does it, perfectly okay. No action taken. If I go and break somebody's, uh, you know, tail light or headlight or something, I'll have to pay for it. If I beat up somebody with a lati, I'll have to pay for it. And you know? be prosecuted. And be prosecuted, yeah. But uh, if the policeman does it, it's okay. You know, and uh, he might, I don't know, he might break somebody's leg or break somebody's arm. And you say, it's okay. Right. So uh, in this context, it's uh, interesting that you mentioned, of course, Jamia and JNU, because uh, one of the aspects of the Hathras incident is the chief minister's statement after, where he said that uh, the kind of media response, the outrage that has come, the protests that have broken out. All this has been framed around the supposed international conspiracy to destabilize the administration of the state. And the international conspiracy is something the chief minister, the head of the government of Uttar Pradesh is actually saying that there is this foreign funding and this is happening. And we know over the past few years, especially that this is not something new. Conspiracy is uh, seems to be the uh, key word of the government at every point of time. We saw it in the Delhi riots. We saw it in Bhima Korigao. We have seen uh, we have seen leaders say everywhere there are always some foreign elements who are working with uh, say anybody who raises a voice against the government supposedly to create a conspiracy. So could you both maybe talk a bit about how this conspiracy culture has reached such a situation where even uh, talking about an incident like this may end up being called a conspiracy. So. Uh, Justin Lokur, I'm also seeing this only in the last uh, three or four or five years. Uh, before this, uh, we have seen rapes, as you point out. It's also nothing new. But I am seeing uh, that now every single uh, incident which concerns the public at large, whether it was Bhima Koregao or whether it was, uh, and let's not forget, Bhima Koregao is, has, is a fallout of a meeting which was for which our Justice P.B. Savant has taken responsibility for being one of the organizers of that meeting. It was perfectly legitimate. It was in broad daylight. It was part of the right to organize, uh, part of 191A rights, etc. And yet we are now being told that was a conspiracy. But the, similarly, of course, 
uh, in the Delhi riots, right? A conspiracy, a conspiracy, a conspiracy. And then finally, now in the Hathras case, we are again being told that we are all conspirators. I don't know tomorrow you and I and Justice Lokuk might be in a conspiracy to you know, discuss this whole issue on, uh, on, on this web website and we might be conspirators. So uh, in my opinion, it is not just the conspiracy that I would like to draw attention to, but the conspiracy to do what? Conspiracy to destabilize the government of India, conspiracy to destroy the sovereignty of the country, conspiracy for sedition. Okay. Now this is the this is where I find a problem. <laughs> it's one thing to tell me that I have been part of a riotous crowd and leave it at that. Yes, I will be prosecuted for rioting. But to go that extra step and to say not only was I part of a riot, but that this purpose of this riot was a conspiracy to destabilize the government of India or the government of a state or the national integrity of the country or the sovereignty of the country. This is what I find problematic. In my opinion, the only reason to do that is to bring in the UAPA Act where bail cannot be granted. This is how I would analyze the situation. Otherwise, I don't see any reason why it can't be called a riot simpliciter. Yeah, yeah. yeah you see, um, if you remember maybe about uh, 50 years ago, there used to be a lot of talk about a foreign hand, right? Yes. So when you talk about an international conspiracy, you're saying the same thing. You know, it's a foreign hand that is involved. Now, how, how long are we going to keep talking about this foreign hand, you know, or this foreign conspiracy, right? And it seems, it seems that the idea is you pitch everything very high. You know, the sovereignty of the country is in danger. The integrity of the country is in danger. So, well, you may not be able to prove that. I don't think anybody has been uh, behaving in a manner that is going to, you know, impact on the sovereignty or integrity of our country. So, bring it down a little bit, you know, later on. You know, put it in the charge sheet, sovereignty, integrity, this, that and the other. Ultimately, somebody might be held liable for riot. You know, okay. But anyway, we made our point. So, I, I think I would agree with you, uh, Indira. Uh, you know, when you say that uh, things are being pitched too high, you know, foreign hand, foreign conspiracy, so on and so forth, just to bring in UAPA, you know, or maybe just to bring in sedition. You know, journalists are being arrested for writing articles or going to write an article. Recently, somebody had was going to Athras. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, this guy is sedition. You know, I think probably UAP also in his case. I don't know. So, yeah, pitch it high. And, uh, you know, the, the famous, uh, the, uh, the, the, the answer to all this is let the law take its own course. Mm. But then, you know, if, you, if you pervert the law, you know, obviously it's going to take a perverted course. Precisely. And the uh, objective has been achieved. You keep that person in jail, maybe for one month, two months, three months, four months. Right. And years in the case of some of those accused in the Bhima Konigao case, definitely. And in this context, I also wanted to, of course, bring up something which the both of you have talked about, written about, that is the issue of protest itself. And uh, we talked about conspiracy in the case of a riot, but today what we also see is that Many of the so-called conspirators were just people who organized meetings, who organized protests, like uh, like you said, exercised their rights under the constitution. So what we're seeing is also a climate where any kind of protest automatically becomes, the, there is a possibility that it could be seen as a criminal act because that is a precedent that is being set by the government through its narratives, formally and informally, through the various WhatsApp groups, media channels, all of them creating this atmosphere. So could you maybe both talk a bit about also what is happening with the uh, freedom of people to protest right now in the country, given the kind of uh, restrictions the government is placing? Uh, 
before uh, I make any comments on that, I would like to pose a question, uh, which I hope Justice Lokur will come in on. Uh, Justice Lokur, I find that when the ruling establishment, which lodges FIRs for sedition, they conflate the uh, sovereignty and integrity of India with disaffection for the government. Okay, is there a conflation going on here? I may, I may be, I I may have no affection for a particular government or. I may be very critical of a government. I may have a different point of view, but it doesn't mean that I don't love my country. Okay, yeah. I, I might be a supreme patriot. Okay, and 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 someone who loves my nation, and maybe because I love my nation so much, that is the reason why I'm raising my voice. That's the reason why I'm protesting. But here, what we are seeing is that the 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 our ruling powers seem to equate themselves with the nation. Okay, and if there is any kind of calling out of what they're doing, it is as if we are unpatriotic. The word anti-national is thrown at us all the time. So am I seeing over here a complete abuse of even the plain language of Section 124A, that is sedition and the law declared by the Supreme Court of India? And is it not time to call this out? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, <clears throat> if you see the... Um... Uh, statistics about uh, you know sedition cases uh, the numbers are rising right the uh, ncrb apparently started keeping the statistics only from 2014 onwards and every year the numbers are rising now the supreme court has said not only uh, you know in the case of um, the state of bihar uh, case kedarnath singh versus state of bihar long time back in the 1960s that there must be incitement to violence or there must be violence. Even uh, fairly recently, uh, when uh, the day Mrs. Indira Gandhi was assassinated, you know, some uh, two people raised uh, some slogans. Supreme Court said that's all right, you know, it had no reaction, it had no impact, you know, two people raising a slogan, so what? You know, it's not an incitement to violence, it can't be sedition. So that is what the Supreme Court has been saying. But today, you know, you have somebody who acts in a play, as it happened in uh, Bangalore. Oh, you know, you're acting in a play, the play has got some hidden meaning or some scene or something or some dialogue or something. That's sedition. So the child's mother is arrested for sedition. The teacher is arrested for sedition. Some teenager wants to shout a couple of slogans in a crowd, which is definitely not going to, you know, incite violence. She's put behind bars and she's there for about four months. Right? You have journalists who've been uh, arrested for sedition. Where is that violence? Or where is that incitement to violence? You know, which, which is essential to sedition. It's just not there. You know, some crackpot somewhere shouts something, you say, oh, you know, sedition. Can't be like that. And surely our country is not <laughs> so weak, you know, that if a handful of people shout a couple of slogans, oh, you know, India is going to disintegrate it. It's, it our country is not like that. You know? And we have our fundamental rights guaranteed under the Yeah, government. absolutely. So to answer your question about protest, I would like to link it once again to the issue of sedition because it's it's an issue which I think the Supreme Court needs to revisit. Yes. And it concerns an abuse of the process of law. When you say, if you say you have a right to protest, now you have a right to protest against the policies of any government. Now. I saw this in the judgment of Justice Sudarshan Reddy in the Selva Judam case, where he said, we are each entitled to our own view on what is the best path to development, okay? We all agree 
that all of us want development for this country. We want the end of poverty. We want an improvement in the standard of living of ordinary people. But there are different paths to achieve that result. And what Justice Sudarshan Reddy said in the judgment was, we are each entitled to our own um, interpretation of what is the best path for development, so long as it's a non-violent path. Now, when it came to Priya Pillay, the Delhi High Court, uh, through Justice Shakhtar, said you, she cannot be stopped from going abroad in order to give evidence before, before the British Parliament that, in her opinion, coal mining was destroying the, the Adivasis. So we are entitled to our opinions and we are entitled to protest in support of our opinions. If we cannot protest in support of our opinions, then our right to protest has no meaning. After all, what is the meaning of the word protest? If I'm saying loud and clear, I disagree with you, right? And I, I want to be heard. I want to be heard loud and clear. Now, there are ways and ways of doing it. One is to go to court and challenge any action, but it's not the only way. We, we have a right to protest um, in public spaces. And this is what I think is being compromised by filing cases against us when we protest for so-called sedition yes. or, or, or for writing or anything else. Yeah. You know, I, I would also say <clears throat> that the judgment of the Supreme Court, the Constitution Ben judgment in Kedarnath Singh is pretty clear. Right? Now, when a person is charged with sedition because he or she has given a particular opinion or has expressed a particular opinion, I think it's the duty of the trial court where that person is produced to say that, I want to know how is this sedition? You know, and because it, it does not amount to sedition, therefore a police demand is declined or bail is granted. You know, I, I, I think the, the lower judiciary, the, uh, you know, the trial courts have to be alive to the fact that there is a judgment of the Supreme Court and you have to implement it. That's it. You know, and if the, if the police brings somebody and says, well, this man has committed sedition, all right, on what basis are you saying he's committed sedition? He's committed sedition because he's written an article. So, does that amount to sedition? It doesn't amount to sedition. So, therefore, I decline to, uh, uh, you know, uh, give police remand. Or if, he, uh, if he's applied for bail, I grant him bail. You know, if, if, if this... If this, if the, if the law laid down by the Supreme Court is followed, then all this would stop. But unfortunately, it's not happening. That, that's, that, that's one of the main problems. And so, therefore, now you have an increase in UAPA. You know, so you say, all right, this person is a terrorist. By that definition, we would all be terrorists. <laughs> or, or even discussing these issues. But just a few words perhaps you could tell us about this growing tendency of abuse of the process of law, of what we understand by the word malicious prosecution, of when a police officer knowingly files a false FIR or a false charge sheet against us. We, we feel helpless. We feel helpless either as recipients of this FIR or as lawyers defending uh, a person against whom such an FIR. So can we think of some remedies against abuse of the process of law? I, I, think, the, I think one is that uh, if a situation like this arises, you know, the courts have to be tough. You know, they, you know it very well that the police and the courts just don't get along or the police and lawyers just don't get along. They can't. Right? It is, it's not something that is happening today. It's been there for centuries. So, the courts should question on what is the material that you have? If you don't have any material, I'm not going to help you, you know, just because you think somebody is a terrorist or just because you think somebody is seditious or whatever. The courts have to be tough. The lawyers, if they're given an opportunity, well, they will be tough. 
we've had instances in delhi where you know uh, things have been uh, manipulated but the lawyer said no we we want to go into it and it was found by an independent commission by a sitting judge of the delhi high court that the records had been manipulated by the police so the legal profession the, the the lawyers in the fraternity have to be tough the judges have to be tough we are not dealing with small things we are dealing with constitutional rights we are dealing with the freedom of speech we are dealing with the freedom of expression we are dealing with the right to protest peacefully right so if if those rights are protected and they have to be protected by the courts by the lawyers and of course by the state because if if uh, somebody files a false uh, charge sheet the state should also come up and say that listen what what are you doing you know they they can't get away with all this or at least they should not be allowed to get away with all this so it does seem like a very long battle uh, that we have to wage and in that context if you could uh, tell us a few things about a very interesting article that you wrote recently in the wire on building an accountability jurisprudence yeah we have to you see now uh, you know this uh, uh, the allahabad high court had said when these posters were put up of uh, these 50 people who are supposed to have damaged property right the allahabad high court said that the uh, the uh, hoarding you know should be removed forthwith that is the word used forthwith the state of up filed an slp in the supreme court without a stay application there was no stay application so the question of the supreme court granting a stay against the order of the allahabad high court did not arise but that uh, holding was not taken down until there were some rains and a storm and all that and that storm took down the holding okay so here you have a situation where on the face of it the order of the allahabad high court has been violated no action taken they have sent notices to all these people saying that uh, you know you pay for it okay now one of the items which i read in uh, a newspaper it was a very good article written by somebody it said that shoes have also been included the shoes of some policeman or something now what is the value of those shoes how do how do you know you know is it the value uh, the the uh, price at which it was purchased or is it the depreciated price <laughs> the shoes two years old you know i mean what's going on <laughs> so how we tempted to say the law is an ass or it's too serious a matter to say that because somebody's life is on the line somebody's liberty is on the line yeah and people have been asked to pay couple of lakhs you know shoes shoes costing 2000 rupees i don't know maybe they don't cost 2000 rupees how do i know you know i mean it can just go on and on and on but look at it from the reverse side you have the police breaking somebody's uh, motorcycle lights you have the police breaking a cctv camera which belongs to the state no action taken why when you talk about equality we got to talk about equality in every aspect you can't say that you know equality only in some aspect not in some other aspects so this accountability i think is important and it is becoming more and more important there was uh some gathering or something in uh, delhi the railway station the metro stations were blocked I and mean, they were closed under the orders of the state barricades were put up right so that people can't go 
now you inconvenience everybody you inconvenience hundreds of people who are using the metro thousands of people maybe who are using the metro and you say no 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 it's perfectly okay why because some people and every time we are told you know handful of people who are protesting all right if it's a handful of people who are protesting 20 30 40 people so you can't control them so therefore you inconvenience uh, you know a couple of thousand uh, commuters what what logic is there in this i i i find this whole thing very strange actually i got the impression reading the article that you were suggesting that these are ways and means of curbing protest yeah it, it happens through what looks like an innocuous measure but the intent of the measure is actually to uh, you know block people from gathering or block people from protesting at a particular point of time in different ways so an administration doesn't even have to announce that they are going to stop a protest they can just do it by by withdrawing transport yes but that was the impression that i got on reading the article yeah also you know <clears throat> these protesters they are put into a into a truck or into a bus or something they are taken to the delhi border and they are left over there how are they going to come back you know nobody thinks about that <laughs> so from the delhi border they have to start walking back home you know if they are able to catch a bus or something good if they are not able to catch a bus or a scooter or a taxi or something walk back home you know so the, the, the these are ways and means of uh, you know which are being employed putting up those barricades you know we've got intelligence report that there's going to be uh, you know a problem so we put up barricades so there's a huge traffic jam on one particular day guys were stuck in traffic for 2 hours why because they said oh, some intelligence report is there that there's going to be a problem so uh, ways and means and you know i mean every day new ways and means are coming up <laughs> to ensure that uh, protests don't take place you know so you now have protests or confined to jantar mantar my understanding is that the capacity over there is maybe about 1000 or 1500 right what what is the use of uh, a protest like that supposing a lot of people want to protest farmers for example they are doing rail roko why are they not being arrested They're stopping trains so it can't be selective you know and if you tell farmers that listen you just go to jantar mantar only 1000 of you i mean i don't know just <laughs> lokur i am uh, fast getting the impression that uh, we the judiciary in this country is silent for want of a better word and as so far as i know the only means that are available to citizens at the end of the day is to approach the judiciary if for relief in situations of this kind and if the judiciary goes silent here no evil see no evil speak nothing then do we do we have a way of reclaiming the judiciary for ourselves and for the people of this country i'd like to ask you this final question how do we reclaim the judiciary and bring it back to its core function of delivering justice yeah you see i uh, i i have uh, expressed a view on uh, more than one occasion that our judiciary should introspect right there should be a dialogue if the judiciary thinks what they're doing is right perfectly okay you know have have a dialogue have uh, an introspection if you come to the conclusion that what we are doing is okay you know a lot of people are talking a lot of nonsense fair enough if you think on introspection and dialogue you know with uh, amongst themselves or amongst others lawyers and so on that 
you know something more needs to be done fair enough do it you know but not doing anything or apparently apparently not doing anything because i i don't know if uh, something is happening or not but apparently not doing anything is not helping anybody you know i i very strongly think that it it is it is the time has come there is a lot of uh, you know uh, criticism so to speak uh, about uh, the judiciary you know it, it may be valid it may not be valid i'm not going into that but as long as it is there you know it it is time for the judiciary to sit down and uh, introspect i'm not only talking about the supreme court it could be the high court you know maybe some strange decisions have come from a particular state you know or the uh, district judiciary of a particular state the high court judges need to sit down and say you know why why are we getting these strange orders you know it could be any state but i think that uh, you know introspection trying to find out you know are we on the right track i think that's very very important mm. very interesting suggestion i think uh, some kind of a some kind of a self audit uh, by the judiciary yeah. of its own functioning from the point of view of uh, rule of law yeah which which is in my opinion the core function of the judiciary how does how do you maintain the rule of law and that if there could be a judicial audit even if it is a self audit even if as you say the judiciary if they introspect even within themselves if they could come up with some understanding of, of where do they stand on the issue of rule of law uh, that for me is a very interesting suggestion that you are making and you see uh, take sedition for example you know why is bail being denied to people uh, on the ground of sedition now it it is something which i think a lot of people in the legal profession are talking about is it not possible for the judges of the high court or of the supreme court or whatever to sit down and say that listen why is it happening you know and is it right you know should should bail be declined if it yeah, if, if, the, if they come to the conclusion that yes bail should be declined fair enough but if they come to the conclusion that bail should not be declined and it is being declined some corrective steps will need to be taken so yeah in, introspection is necessary unfortunately justice lokur an impression has grown ground in the media and among the public that judges have become executive minded what is what they deliver is what the ruling parties or the governments of the day want them to deliver this is the sad reality that we are faced with after having devoted our life to the judiciary you as a judge me as a practicing lawyer and it makes me at least hang my head in shame yeah there, there is yeah people have said that uh, the judiciary has been execu executivized but then yeah think about it thank you so much justice madan lokur senior advocate indra jay singh for this conversation for taking us through some of the problematic aspects we see today some of the possibilities ahead and like the both of you said may they may there be better days in the future as well thank you so much thank you thank you thank you just look thank, thank you we in touch with you yeah. that's all we are time for today keep watching news click and the leaflet Thank <laughs> you.